This week on ACT OUT, media literacy has perhaps never been more important than it is today. And as corporate media continues to dodge reality like bullets in the matrix, some headline translations can help us to see the truth behind the lies. Next up, Hurricane Dorian devastated the Bahamas, but didn't end there. Jenna from Mutual Aid Disaster Relief talks about the aid efforts happening in the southeast United States and the importance of solidarity rather than charity. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. To start off this week, I'm, I'm going to try out a new segment, Translation Services. As we work on media literacy, deciphering bullshit, separating reality from propaganda, the, the practice of translating headlines, and indeed entire paragraphs or articles from systemic drivel to real talk is a skill that needs constant upkeep. So as much for me as for you, let's work out. This week, following last week's Democratic debate, I thought this one from The New Yorker was a nice, deceptive play on the call for unity. Appearing before the debates, this headline reads, Something for the Democrats to try at the debates. A little togetherness. That sounds so nice. Working together, collaborating, the very antithesis to a combative and competitive capitalist system. Problem is that this article is more so suggesting that instead of w waiting to fall in line with the DNC once they've rigged the primaries and pushed out any progressive voices, candidates should preemptively fall in line because 2020, unlike any other year apparently, is an extraordinary election year. The article thereby suggests that Dems actually fear another Trump presidency, when in reality what establishment Dems fear is a progressive presidency. You only have to look at other sites like CNN, where a quick scroll showed Biden's name roughly a dozen times, Warren's a half dozen, and Bernie no times. And as news continues to leak about Warren's backdoor meetings with Hillary Clinton, I can only assume we'll be hearing more about Warren and more of nothing about Bernie. Furthermore, the article makes it sound like Dems all agree on issues like climate change and universal health care and that the details, you know, those can be worked out later. But that's bullshit. It's also a total cop out. For instance, when asked about the threat of climate change in the first debate, Kamala Harris's response was the real threat is Russia and North Korea. And then at the last debate, the climate question added up to whether people should go vegan like Cory Booker. Dems have further doubled down on this flippant stance by refusing to have a specific debate about climate chaos. Bernie's the only one that has come out with a climate emergency plan, while Uncle Joe is claiming that he doesn't take fossil fuel cash while at a fundraiser co-hosted by a fossil fuel company co-founder. You couldn't make this shit up. And universal health care? Do you mean Biden suggesting that poor people be basically less poor? Because that's always worked for him. Or Harris's back ass was confusion about what universal health care is, but oh, also, I don't support it. Another issue noted in the article is the humane treatment of immigrants. I guess they're not talking about deporter in chief Obama or the fact that he also put people in cages. Oh, shit, my bad. I'm not really good at the togetherness thing, I guess. These aren't details to be worked out later. These are fundamental differences that separate the status quo dipshits from anyone who actually wants to change any course of this country. Togetherness, as suggested in this article, is a togetherness of and for the powers that be. It's a silencing of legitimate issues and real world solutions in the name of maintaining an elitist, corporatized Democratic Party. And therefore, the ironic thing is that this call for unity only divides people. As we saw in 2016, people are more than happy to stay home or vote for a two-paid overstuffed penis wrinkle than vote for your shining example of Democratic Party unity. The Democratic Party begs for unity because your allegiance is all it has. It's an empty shell filled with the skeletons of movements and ghosts of good intentions. It survives off of you in more ways than one. And it will do anything to keep doing nothing. As comedian Louis Black once said, the Republicans are a party of bad ideas and the Democrats are a party of no ideas. Indeed, as a party, the Democratic platform lines up more snugly with the Republicans than not. They just hide it behind a facade of giving a fuck, a facade that our togetherness only props up. 
So when you see the words togetherness and unity floating around the Dems, know what they really mean is fall in line behind the flaccid and ultimately unelectable. Since Hurricane Dorian, a lot of attention has been focused on the Bahamas, and rightfully so. As of the taping of this show, some 1,500 people are missing. The death toll continues to rise as bodies are found amidst the rubble. Some estimates suggest it could be as many as 3,000 dead. Some 70,000 have been left homeless. And in typical U.S. fashion, a report last week showed that the refugees fleeing the devastated island were ordered off a ferry bound for the U.S. because they didn't have their papers in order. But we're still concerned that the Cuban and Venezuelan people are living in the horrors of free health care. Meanwhile, the age of climate chaos swung back through the Bahamas this past weekend as a tropical storm dumped rain onto the northwest part of the island. Conditions did stabilize by late Saturday, but the devastation in the Bahamas cannot be overestimated. Still, as we acknowledge this peak of disaster, we have to also recognize the scope and breadth of Hurricane Dorian. Communities in the southeastern United States who were hit by this massive storm have gotten little to no media attention and, as per usual, little to no support from government agencies and big NGOs. Here to talk more about the situation on the ground in the southeast is Jenna, a community organizer with Tidewater Solidarity Collective and Mutual Aid Disaster Relief. Take a look. So what's happening right now, as far as I can see, is that the media is significantly downplaying the effects of the storm um, on the Carolinas um, and on the East Coast generally. Um, what I have seen is that, uh, you know, if you look at satellite images of the Outer Banks before and after the storm, the shape of those islands has been permanently altered. Um, they're, they're shaped completely differently. Sections of them are gone. Um, and those sections did used to have houses on them. Um, so there's there's that, you know, to kind of put that in like a broader context. And one thing that I've been thinking, um, you know, kind of watching the media just move on from this um, is that I think uh, part of the reality of climate disaster is that storms and events that would have been mythologized 100 years ago barely make a 24 hour news cycle at this point. Um, so you have a lot of people who have been flooded out of their homes. Um, you have a lot of people who have completely lost, you know, those homes. They won't be able to recoup them if the flooding's been too bad. Um, you have a lot of people who have lost uh, their their businesses, their transportation, um, you know, all of which amounts to a life shattering thing for working class people, you know, who have to get to work and continue to live under capitalism. Um, one example that I can think of um, is a, a man in Ocracoke, North Carolina, which actually has gotten a little bit of media attention, who runs the um, the famous taco stand there in Ocracoke. Um, it's amazing. The best tacos ever. Um, uh, his name is Eduardo, and he and his family have lost everything. Like, they lost their food truck. That was their entire livelihood. His insurance, you know, isn't paying for all of it. Um, and this is, this is you know, an immigrant family, and, you know, they are not wealthy, and they're, they're not really getting any help. One thing that people haven't really seemed to consider is that this hurricane in particular uh, threw, like, 15 tornadoes, I think maybe even more. And those tornadoes were actually more devastating for some people than the storm itself. Um, in Emerald Isle, North Carolina, which um, also hasn't gotten a lot of attention there, uh, they were devastated by tornadoes. And that is a community um, that is, is working class, is communities of color, um, black and indigenous communities there that have largely been forgotten and, and left without help. Um, so all over the Carolinas, um, there are people who, while, you know, we're definitely glad that they didn't lose their lives, they have lost everything else. Um, and, and not a whole lot of help is, is coming for them because we're seeing, you know, that gap in obviously government agencies, FEMA, we know that they, you know, don't care and that they are very bureaucratic and gatekeeping about who they choose to help. But um, in a lot of cases recently, they just haven't even been there. <laughs> 
And I, I, I definitely want to get into the, the work that, uh, that Mad Relief is doing, but you mentioned, you know, immigrant families. I'm curious if you're seeing, uh, you know, part of like this whole disaster capitalism is that ICE and CBP will take advantage of a situation like this to then further prey on, on the most marginalized folks in a community. Have you heard about stories about that, like after Dor- Dorian? Absolutely. Um, We've heard stories like that from all over the East Coast. People are afraid to go to shelters because ICE will come to those shelters. They're disgustingly opportunistic. And most of those shelters will cooperate with them and let them inside. So you have a situation where people, uh, you know, they need to evacuate and they need to be in a safe place. But the only safe place for them to be is not actually safe. Um, And so we've tried to encourage um, you know, faith congregations and other community organizations that might have physical space to open those spaces up as actual safe shelters where they, you know, they guarantee that they won't allow any ICE or law enforcement in. Um, But, you know, that's been kind of an uphill battle. And and most of the shelters that people know about are, you know, the public schools and the the government shelters that, that just really aren't safe. So talk about w- with regards to the, the mutual aid disaster relief, and we've had we've had uh, folks from mutual aid disaster relief on the show before, but I always think it's important to to reiterate this. Um, the the uh, the point of mutual aid disaster relief being solidarity, not charity, and how that uh, how you deal with something post uh, like a disaster like Dorian with regards to community needs and addressing those needs. So. Obviously, our motto is solidarity, not charity. And that's really important um, to the work that we do, because what that means is that, you know, a lot of these organizations come in as the charitable giver on high and they decide who deserves support and who gets that support. And our model is is about rejecting that and is about, um, you know, meeting people where they're at as equals. You know, we all need a little bit of help sometime. And I like to think that if I was in that situation, that people would come and help me um, and, and just really really uh, inviting them um, and facilitating and empowering them to to take place uh, to take part in in the relief themselves. And a lot of what we find when we go into areas, because we only, you know, we we go into underserved areas where we know that people are being forgotten and, and aren't being helped. And most of what we find when we go into those places is that those communities are already organizing and those neighbors are already taking care of of themselves. And so what we can do as outsiders is to come humbly and to make connections with those people just on a human level and ask them where the needs are and how we can assist them. And that's basically what we do. And, you know, when we make those connections, when we build those friendships with the people that are impacted, you know, they end up telling us things like, oh, there's an older woman down the street who really needs some help and she can't get out. Or there's this family down here, you know, they know what their community needs. Um, and, and we see a lot in a disaster. I, I think that, um, you know, kind of when the grid goes offline, the alienation and isolation of capitalism kind of starts to erode. Um, and people know that if they want to survive, that they're going to have to do that together. And so it is a perfect, um, you know, place for, for us to kind of come in um, and offer some assistance and offer, you know, maybe some ideas about different ways of doing things that don't have to be bureaucratic and gate kept and hierarchical, um, that don't have to be judgmental. We also try to do, you know, a lot of skill sharing so that because a lot of the people that are impacted by these storms, they live in areas where like this is not the first storm and it won't be the last storm. And the next storm is probably going to be worse. And so um We think that it's very important to like share skills that we've learned, Um, you know, whether it's how to use a chainsaw or how to set up a supply distro um, so that those people can continue to do that when the out of town volunteers go home. Because um, this is not about us. Um, This is not about us as individuals or as an organization. Our core mission is to go in and find people on the ground who are already doing that work and empower and support them and, and connect with them and befriend them however we can. Something that, uh, for instance, that I saw some of when I was in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria was that they p- folks were, because FEMA was so utterly useless, 
it kind of inspired folks to build things that were outside the purview of the system, you know, like their own, like digging their own wells and being able to be self-sufficient. Is that something that you're also seeing in these communities? Like they're realizing that, well, fuck, we can't rely on these people. So next time something happens, we're going to have this already set up system. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a lot of and that's exactly what we find when we go into these impacted areas is that the people there have already started organizing. They've already set up their own infrastructures and their own networks for dealing with these problems and for planning ahead. Um, <clears throat> when we were in Lumberton last year in Lumberton, North Carolina, um, after Hurricane Florence, there was an amazing community led uh, relief effort there in a, in a county that is. Um, largely an indigenous county the lumbee native people live there um and you know so we know that the settler colonial government you know gives no aid or no attention to indigenous communities and so these people knew um that they had to take that into their own hands and you know we had our warehouse distro we were pushing out supplies and the community was coming and helping us to do that and you know, we had meals together. It was amazing. Um, but I, I remember really clearly one night in particular, one of the one of the local guys said to me, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do this all the time? And I was like, yes, absolutely. You know, like, how can how can we how can we help that to happen? You know, how can we facilitate that? How can we help you guys? Um, and I hear that from a lot of people, you know, why don't we care for each other like this all the time? And so I've seen people building food pantries and I've seen them building wellness centers. Um, I've seen them, you know, fixing each other's flooded homes and tarping roofs and, um, you know, pooling their their very limited resources together to make sure that everyone's OK. Um, one of the coolest things that I saw was uh, actually people coming together to do um like herbal and plant medicine trainings, because people don't always have access to, you know, the healthcare system. Um, and uh, so there are a lot of things that people can do to care for each other without access to that. And so, you know, teaching people how to make tinctures and various plant medicines, also teaching them um, as much medical skill really as is possible to teach someone in the amount of time that you have. Um, the idea there being, that that knowledge, that all knowledge should be horizontal so that people can continue to care for each other and, and build that autonomous infrastructure. Yeah. And, and so with that, um, talk about some of the needs that you're seeing on the ground. Like what are some of the most, uh, the, the most obvious and uh, what are some of the specific things that you're seeing that people really need on the ground there? So one of the biggest, biggest, biggest things uh, about a flood is that, you know, regardless of whether or not your entire house is a loss, you now have mold because your house has been flooded. And mold is a very, very, very serious thing that a lot of people don't consider. Um, actually, I've never seen it mentioned on the news in terms of hurricane relief or, or hurricane impact. But, uh, you know, you end up in areas where now everybody in the community has a mold infested home that can cause you know, a number of health problems ranging from, you know, respiratory issues to death, depending on the type of mold. And a lot of people don't know how to how to mitigate that mold and how to deal with it. So um, one thing that we're doing this weekend here in my area is we're going down to the Outer Banks and we're taking mold remediation kits um, and information about how to remediate the mold and how to be safe, um, you know, getting rid of the mold and to make sure that it's really gone. So that's a huge need. A lot of people's homes were flooded out. They need um, both that knowledge to be shared and they need, uh, you know, that those materials to be shared, which includes things like N95 masks so that they're safe breathing it, um, Tyvek suits. Um, a lot of people think that that bleach is OK to use, but bleach is only going to help you if it's a non-porous surface. If you have drywall, bleach is not good enough because um, you're going to have roots, you know, getting in the pores of that drywall. And so. You need uh, hydrogen peroxide or vinegar um, for that. And, um, you know, that might sound kind of counterintuitive. People think bleach is good for everything. So um, that's something that we really, really need is stuff to make sure that we can be as sure as possible that people are not living in mold infested homes. Um, people have baby needs. We're hearing a lot of requests for diapers um, and, you know, uh, in all sizes baby foods, Pedialyte, that sort of thing, um, because a lot of the stores got sold out 
of that stuff before the storm. Um, and a lot of people are waiting, you know, for them to be restocked, but the area is so destroyed that that is taking a longer amount of time. And so you end up with a situation of enormous scarcity. Um, food and water, obviously non-perishables, plenty of water, though I will say that most um, most hurricane relief donation drives focus on things like food and water and kind of forget these other things. So um, I'm not saying please send us all of that, um, but you know, that's also nice. Um, and uh, you know, things like hygiene products and pe you know, people want to feel clean and, and, and some sense of normalcy. They've just lost everything. They're covered in flood water. You know, they, um, just having something like the ability to take a shower or brush your teeth or change clothes means an enormous amount to someone who has just lost that. We've covered this on the show before, the the hazard of flood water. Like it's not, I mean, it's filled with radioactive material. It's filled with, I mean, especially in places like North Carolina, the runoff from, you know, things like hog farms or industrial uh, CAFOs and things like that. Uh, how are how do you how do you go about like addressing those those type of issues? Last year in North Carolina, you know, and I live here in Norfolk, and we flood a lot too. So I thought that I knew a flood, but being in North Carolina last year and seeing the runoff from those hog farms, um, seeing the chemical runoff, that water was like rusty red, and it reeked of sewage and dead fish. Um, it is a very rememberable smell that I, I still remember and have never experienced anywhere else. And people died because of that water. There was a man in Wilmington, you know, he had a cut on his leg and he was out in his yard doing something. And they said within 24 hours, his leg was amputated and 24 hours after that he died. So this is very, very, very serious the state of this flood water. So for ourselves, um, as people who are out doing search and rescue, we, you know, we use waders, we have, you know, like, uh, like fly fishing type of suits and whatnot. We have our, our canoes, our kayaks. We try to be very on top of that to keep the people that work with us safe. We also want to keep the people that we're encountering on the ground safe, obviously. And so one really big thing that we ask for people to send, so this is kind of the last question also, is antifungal creams um, and sprays and things like that. We for a while last year, we would just like roll around and see if we saw anyone like walking through the flood water and just give them antifungal cream, antifungal spray and recommend to them that they use it and let them know where they could seek the help of a medic, you know, if they ended up with a rash or, or anything like that. We saw a lot of rashes um, and bumps and, uh, you know, thankfully, um, we didn't encounter anyone who it really got really, really bad with like that man in Wilmington, but we did see a lot of children even with, with rashes and bumps and sores from the water. Um, and you know, one thing that we can do to kind of mitigate that would be systemic, would be environmental. Um, but you know, that's, that's not something that the people on the ground are, are able to do, but I do think that it's worth mentioning that um, it never should have gotten to a point to where a hurricane caused such an environmental disaster regarding these factory farms and, and chemicals. Um, so education uh, about the danger of it um, and resources to mitigate it, like antifungals and, and uh, you know, other medicines, I, I would say. And this kind of cir circles back a little bit to, you know, you mentioned the systemic issues and, and, and part of that is also a lot like in that community organizing aspect. Are there ways that folks can prepare in, you know, in light of climate chaos and worsening storms? How can folks better prepare so that, I mean, it's still going to be chaos, but to try and mitigate the chaos that they experience after, after the fact? Um, I'm a big believer in the fact that all of the things that we do to organize in the community and basically organize rapid response can be seen as kind of practice for a worsening situation. Um, mutual aid disaster relief does a lot of skill sharing. Um, and so that's one thing that people can do is to, to learn, um, and share as many skills as you possibly can, whether it's, you know, how to use a chainsaw if you have a tree down or as much medical knowledge as you can possibly get, know how to muck a house, um, know how to remediate mold, know how to organize um, the distribution space. Like all of these, I kind of saw as practice. 
you know, we're doing something that's impactful right now, but we are also learning for the future so that we can do this more and more efficiently and more and more rapidly and more people can be empowered to participate in that. So one thing that I would suggest to people to do to prepare um, would actually be to get involved in a project like this if they're able to, because the people that you will meet and the things that you will do will teach you what you need to know to be prepared. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, uh, we can't be prepared for everything. Um, and I think, you know, that's important to say because a lot of people get really panicked and think, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, you know, what do I do? Um, you do the best that you can. And in my opinion and, and what I've seen, one of the things that you can do um, is participate in things like this to the best of your ability. Participate in things with your neighbors, you know, like see who's who who needs food today, right? Make that happen. Who needs a, a child care today? Make that happen and build these relationships with the people that live around you so that you kind of already know how to work with them and you know what their needs are. And when something bad happens, you know, you already have that connection built and maybe you've already picked up some skills because you took an interest in that. And, and each time you do it, you'll get more and more efficient at it. Find these people, build these connections, learn these skills and just uh, pay special attention to any opportunity that there is to connect more with the people in my community so that we can put together this kind of rapid response, um, which here in, in Tidewater and a, a lot of other places across the country, um, one expression of that rapid response that we have been doing is uh, with regard to ICE presence um, and with regard to the many, many um, migrant families and asylum seekers who are coming off of buses um, in our areas. And so, you know, we have been meeting them with food and medicine and aid and things like that. And again, very important on the face of it. But what we're also doing there is putting together this network of people in the area who are capable and ready and connected to respond to needs and to problems. So I think the simple answer to that question is learn as much as you can and frame everything that you're doing in terms of how can this be applied to the worsening situation, because it usually can. For information on Dorian drop-off points in the southeast, check out the Dorian Response Autonomous Supply Line via Mutual Aid Disaster Relief's website at mutualaiddisasterrelief.org. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Reminder, the best way to stay up to date on our work is to sign up for the newsletter at the address below. To those who have donated, thank you so much. Please keep spreading the word in order to ensure our ability to keep acting out. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, visit patreon.com slash act out. I can hear the boots are stopping. Come on, boys, let's get some rust to throw. I can't stand to hear my father cry anymore. Try to me that for not you motherfuckers dead in the road. We've been begging up pitch by inch. We got nowhere else to go. It's been too many years since you pushed to set my show.